I went through a season in my life where I felt like my mom was calling me way too much. I know there are folks out there who can relate. One time she called, and I was in the middle of a meeting. I remember rolling my eyes and saying to someone, It's my mom. She keeps calling me. But then the person I was meeting with said, You know, there are times I wish I had my mom around to be overbearing to me. This person had lost their mother at a very young age. I remember thinking to myself, They're right. It's a privilege to even have a mom who is still alive. It's a privilege that many of us don't realize we have until it's gone. And privilege often manifests itself in many different ways and in many different contexts, including the workplace. There's some type of advantage that we have at work, but we don't even realize how good we have it. So what would it look like if we were better at recognizing our own privilege? I'm Madhu Bakanola. This is TED Business. Our speaker today is Miriam Vezade, a lawyer and human rights activist. In this talk, she discusses how acknowledging our privilege can help us be even more inclusive in the workplace. Then after the talk, I'll discuss how accepting our privilege can help us understand others better too. But first, a quick break. Anyone who knows me knows that I love to talk. I'm a chatterbox, just ask anyone. I like to think that I'm pretty good at building rapport with my clients. And having spent just under a decade working as a lawyer, I tell you, this is one skill that really came in handy. Now, I remember this one interstate client in particular. We got on like a house on fire. We spent months corresponding over email and chatting over the phone. And then the day finally came when we would meet face to face. So I walk into the meeting room, and there she is. I say hello, and she kind of gives me this odd look. And she says, oh, you must work for Mariam. And I'm thinking, what, what does she mean? And then it dawns on me. She must think I'm the legal secretary or the assistant, perhaps. Now, not, not that there's anything wrong with having those jobs. But it seems that in her mind, the voice that she's heard on the phone all these months doesn't seem to correspond to the person standing in front of her. Rather unconvincingly, at that point, I say, no, I I, I am Mariam. And then I start to doubt myself. And all those months of rapport building just goes down the drain at that point. As I start again, from scratch, to win her over. I do, of course, eventually win her over, but it was a lot of time and effort wasted, and ultimately yet another hit to my confidence. And the thing is, I have other experiences like that one, and I know plenty of other folks who do too. So today, I want to reflect on how stereotyping, unconscious bias, and societal privilege operates in such a way that creates an unequal playing field for diverse minority groups. Now, let us start with privilege. Privilege is basically unearned advantage. Hey, what the hell, we really didn't do much to earn it. It's basically access to or enjoying rights because you belong to a particular identity. You're part of a club. And here's the thing, I am owning up to mine. I am privileged. And here's the thing, privilege is relative and it's ultimately subjective. And those who have the most amounts of it, they're probably not entirely conscious of it. Because for the most part, and as they say, privilege is largely invisible to those who have it. Now, I work as a diversity and inclusion consultant, so I do spend a hell of a lot of my day thinking about these concepts. Think about this. Whose faces do you see reflected back at you on your television screens? Who holds the top positions in the top ranks of society? Now, except for the few examples here or there, notice the general lack of cultural diversity. 
Now, what we're actually exposed to every day feeds the assumptions that we make about people. We all tend to possess a strong tendency towards people who physically resemble ourselves. It's called affinity bias. Now, experiments have shown us that the brain actually categorizes by race in less than 100 milliseconds. Now, according to Nobel Peace Prize recipient neuroscientist Eric Kandel, he argues that up to 90% of the brain's behavior is actually unconscious. So these little shortcuts that the brain makes, these little implicit associations, these biases, for the most part, they are done unconsciously. And here's the thing, inherent societal privilege means that some of us are given a head start in what I like to call the race of life. And it's because of that head start, not just because we worked extra, extra hard, that there'll always be miles ahead, even if all the participants are running at the same speed and with the same ability. So that's code for the same amount of merits. Now, it's well documented that women of minority groups face even greater hurdles, as you can see. They face both social and institutional barriers to full equality, not just because they're chicks, but because of things such as race, religion, sexuality, or disability. They basically have a double whammy, and that concept is referred to as intersectionality. Now, as an Australian woman who's originally from Afghanistan and a Muslim, I get the triple whammy. I get sexism, I get racism, and I get Islamophobia. You know, some people boast about having a fan base. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I have a troll base. <laughs> Such a clever bunch. They've totally mastered the art of intersectional insults. That's not easy to do. Now, if only I had a dollar for every time someone said, oh, but all appointments should be on merit. Well, of course they should be. But here's the thing, are we assuming that the existing status quo is somehow based entirely on merit? I'm not convinced that it is. But hey, don't take my word for it. Plenty of other people think that too. Now, I recall a conversation I was having with two senior managers. It was about corporate Australia's shift to start focusing on cultural diversity within its leadership ranks now that we're doing better around gender diversity. One of them was a woman of Asian Australian heritage, and she was a former colleague of mine. The other, a colleague of hers, a man of Anglo-Celtic origin. Now, it's in the context of this discussion in which he turns to her, the Asian Australian woman, and says, there you go, another leg up for people like you. Now, she's shocked because they're colleagues, so she says nothing, but I can't stay silent got up on my pedestal and I said, when you extend a hand to a group of people who for far too long have been effectively walking in the gutter while others comfortably stroll the streets, that ain't no leg up. That certainly is not a handout. That's simply levelling the playing field. Now, studies have shown us that to simply attain the same number of interviews as someone with an Anglo-Saxon sounding name, candidates from Indigenous, Middle Eastern and Asian sounding names have to submit a ridiculous amount of more applications. So in this case, when compared to Lisa and Andrew, and these are the real names used in the study, Nadine and Hassan have to submit 64% more applications, while Ming and Hong have to submit 68% more applications. Guys, we're talking about getting a call back to secure an interview. We're not even talking about the kind of biases that will kick in once you're actually at the interviewing table. Now, I can't tell you the number of crappy dad jokes I've had to make to make interviewers feel comfortable when they first meet me early on in, the, in my career. Thanks for laughing. <laughs> <laughs> now, despite the fact that 40% of Australians have at least one parent born overseas, no doubt that's probably true of this arena, that general diversity is not reflected in the top ranks of society. Now, of course, I'm not suggesting there's anything wrong with this, assuming it is truly based 
on a meritocracy. And for culturally diverse women like me, well, you know that glass ceiling? It's double glaze for people like me. Only a tiny percentage of ASX directors are culturally diverse women. At a CEO level, it is even worse. So think about all those stats that I've been telling you about, all those biases that we know about. What message does this send to a generation of top HSE graduates who are culturally diverse? I'm hoping that by this point, some of you are convinced on the moral case for why change is required to level that damn playing field. But then there'll be others who won't be convinced unless we show them the dollar figures. Hey, don't worry, I've got it covered. There is a thing called the diversity dividend. Now, gender diverse companies are 15% more likely to outperform their industry average. While culturally diverse companies, they're 35% more likely to outperform theirs. So diversity brings with it a competitive advantage. And here's the thing, anyone at this point who's thinking, oh, she means tokenistic, visible diversity, no. I'm not asking you to whack on photos of people that look like me onto your website and tick a box. <laughs> Although that might be nice. No, that's not what I'm talking about. Real diversity brings about diversity of perspective and diversity of views and diversity of thought. Ultimately, and of course the inevitable flow-on effects, is that Australian businesses will be able to better reflect and understand the needs of a multicultural Australia who's ultimately their customer base. I want to tell you this. There's never been a more important time for us to be conscious of our unconscious biases and societal privileges. You know when you're driving and you know you've got a blind spot back here? You know it exists, but you can't see it. But you make a concerted effort to turn your head each and every time, to look and to adjust. It's not enough to know that we've got these biases and that we have these levels of privilege. You've got to do something about it. We're living in an era where divisive politics has successfully otherized diverse minority groups and normalized xenophobia against them. We're constantly reading derogatory headlines about diverse minority groups. And what's worse is some of these remarks are made by our elected officials. Now, I believe that when you excuse bigotry in words, you lay the framework to give bigotry in action a free pass. We know that we have an urgent issue of disenfranchisement amongst the youth, particularly those of diverse backgrounds. We want them to reach for the stars. But the thing is, you can't aspire to be someone that you can't see. You can't address inequality equally. You can't. This is why I believe targets are required across industries where diversity of this kind is lacking. Now, why? You ask, why targets? Because the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. Thank you. Miriam's talk was so powerful. She basically conducted a privilege walk with the audience. Have you ever done one of those? You ask a group of people to respond to a series of questions about the kinds of resources or support they've had throughout their lives and how that support has impacted their achievements to date. I've done a similar exercise with my students where I ask questions like, have you grown up in a two-parent household? Do people have trouble pronouncing your name? Have you been asked, where are you really from? Now here's why questions like these are important. They force us to be introspective. Because when you look around and you're the only one of your colleagues standing up, like in Miriam's talk, it forces you to consider the experiences of others. It also makes you take stock of the ways you can and should support those who have been marginalized throughout their lives. And let me introduce you to some language that's being used these days in discussions about privilege. They're metaphors to help people understand how race 
gender, sexuality, class, and other individual traits can give some people an unwarranted advantage over others, especially in the workplace. Let me take you to the airport. We all know that if a plane is traveling in the same direction as the wind, it gets to its destination faster, without any additional work. Privilege works in the same way. If there are two people who are alike in every way, who work with the same intensity and have the same basic competencies, the person who was born, grew up with, or accrued privilege over their lifetime is likely to advance faster and go further than the one who hasn't had these same benefits. So privilege is often referred to as a tailwind. The flip side of a tailwind is a headwind. You know, like when the captain makes an announcement that makes you really angry, they say, we're going to arrive late because there's a strong wind that's slowing the plane down. That's often what it's like when you don't have any kind of privilege to help you get ahead. You face barriers that slow you down. That's why exercises like privilege walks are really important in our organizations. They allow us to stay honest about our tailwinds. And maybe when we're honest about our tailwinds, it inspires people to work harder at understanding one another, creating space for everyone to be more inclusive and empathetic. That's it for today. This episode was produced by Brittany Brown and fact-checked by Julia Dickerson. Special thanks to Anna Phelan, Michelle Quint, Corey Hajim, and Colin Helms. I'm Madupa Akinola. Talk to you again next week.